And of course, now we bring you entertaining uh, football action and, of course, a motorsport. But we will be delving into what is happening with uh, motorsport news this evening as uh, Lufefe joins us uh, to talk about uh, what's happening. You know, when it comes to Formula One, we saw the pre-season uh, testing that was happening in Bahrain earlier on. And of course, uh, before that, you know, it was all the uh, unveiling of the different liveries and, of course, the car. Firstly, a very good evening to you. How are you doing this evening? <laughs> good evening, Chloe Leo. Your energy is so much for a Sunday. Well done. <laughs> Thank you for having me once more. No, absolute, absolute yes. pleasure. Mm. I want us to first talk about the news truly that rocked the world. Uh, when Ferrari made the announcement, Lewis Hamilton will be joining them in the future. How did you receive the news? Was it something that you knew was coming? Well, personally, I was over the moon to hear it. Um, it has been a long time coming. I think it was always a question of when. And I think the timing is immaculate, although the timing of the announcement is a little bit iffy because it's before the season starts. So a lot of people are asking themselves if uh, he will still be committed to Mercedes this year, if Mercedes will be committed to him. Or will he have one eye on Ferrari? People are very conflicted. His fans, of course, do they support Mercedes still? Are they looking at Ferrari? But I think that uh, he's a professional and the integrity of a brand the, of the caliber of Mercedes, I don't see any problems for them for the season. But what do you think broke the camel's back, you know, when it comes to Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes? Uh, some people had seen this as a long-standing relationship, especially when you look at the relationship between Hamilton and Toto Wolff. What led to this decision? Is it a good career move for uh, the record-breaking champion? Well, apparently, uh, they, they couldn't agree on the term of his last contract that he signed. The current one now because he's got a two-year contract until the end of next season but he wanted something like a three-year contract with a possible extension and mercedes said they could not offer him even to give him two years 24 and 25 was a struggle which is why he even signed his contract late last year so i think that was the straw that broke the camel's yeah. back as you said but generally i think it was always part of his long-term plan because it's a lifelong dream for him to drive a ferrari so you don't think it has anything to do with the car itself because he had had a lot of input with how he wanted that car to be uh, redesigned you know and and how it wasn't performing to the level that he felt he would that didn't play a role at all in his decision surely that's a factor as well but if you look at uh, the liveries that you spoke about when they unveiled the car and we saw in preseason testing last week, Wednesday to Friday, that they have followed the philosophy that he's been crying for the last two seasons. Sure. So it's going to be interesting to see how he wraps up uh, this season with Mercedes. But I want us to now talk about Bahrain, uh, what we saw in uh, the preseason testing. Uh -huh. Of course, Red Bull. Uh, you know, it seems like they're going to be front runners once again with uh, Max Verstappen. When you look at the report card, what, what would you say we have in store for this upcoming season? Well, in years gone by, I don't really read much into preseason testing. Hmm. Primarily because no one wants to really show their hand so early in the season. But this year is an anomaly because it's, a longest, it's the longest F1 season that we've seen since F1 came into being in 1950 with 24 races, which means we have two summer breaks in September and I think the other one's in October. And it also means that the season will go until December and it's also starting early because usually the season starts at the end of March, which has meant that there's only one pre-season testing session as opposed to two as we've seen in previous years, mm -hmm. which means everybody now had to dial in so that they can make corrections and the turnaround time between the last day of testing and free practice, which is this Thursday, is only six days in order to iron out all those gremlins which they may have seen in preseason testing. So we can read a lot into this past session. And yes, Red Bull look like the leaders. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Ferrari seem to have made steps forward. Lewis made some comments saying that the car feels better to drive than it has 
in a long time. And what we saw from Aston Martin and McLaren last year, I think they made the most astronomical steps forward. So I expect them to be in the mix. So I think it's Red Bull and then between Aston, McLaren, Ferrari and Mercedes, it's going to be very tight there for second place. Yeah, and, and Verstappen spoke about not believing that they'll have the kind of dominance that they did uh, last season. Uh, do you think he was just being coy, you know, uh, or does he really believe that, you know, Red Bull can again assert that dominance and continue to break these records? Well, I read somewhere during the winter break that Adrian Newey, the chief technical officer of Red Bull, who actually designs the car in terms of aerodynamics, he's basically the chief engineer. He says he was shocked that they were so dominant last year. So, I mean, for me, I wouldn't read anything into what Max is saying uh, because they surprise themselves about how good they are. And I, I feel like last season they didn't even go full throttle. They still had more in the tank if they needed it. Yeah, and, and I mean, you mentioned something very interesting there in terms of a longer year that we uh, are going to be exposed to this season. And of course, uh, you know, in terms of the preseason testing, mm -hmm. one less than what we're used to, mm -hmm. that is going to have an impact, surely. 100%. I mean... The teams that suffered reliability, like your Ferraris, had reliability issues last year. For instance, in day one of testing today, they already had a problem with their car. Teams like that, it's, it's going to be tricky for them if the car isn't 100% reliable, which is why I think most teams, especially in day two, focused on the long runs where they could see if they could do 200 plus laps. I think mainly the concern with that is the reliability of the car. But in terms of performance, obviously they get upgrades in tokens during the course of the season. So they can always make the car faster as the season progresses. But more than anything, I think reliability was an issue. But the front running teams, I think they clocked in a lot of laps, bar McLaren, but on day three, they also did it, got some mileage in. And interestingly, when we look at the design of Red Bull, it seems like they may have copied, you know, a little bit that of uh, uh, Mercedes. Uh, what would be the reason behind that, especially when you're looking at the side pods of, of, of that car? Well, Mercedes came out in 2022 with a zero pods, which means their car had no side pods because they believe that uh, that was the direction that Formula One was going in terms of making another step forward. And, and, but when they got on track, when they checked the lap times that they were doing in the wind tunnel testing versus what's happening on track, they were one second off. Mm -hmm. so, and they stuck to that philosophy even going into the 2023 season. And then that's the one that them and Lewis, they weren't seeing eye to eye on. And Lewis was like, he doesn't think that this is the direction to go. So now for Red Bull to come after having side pods the last two seasons and dominating and then taking the direction while Mercedes goes back to side pods is actually a mystery and I think it took everyone off guard. But that's Red Bull for you. They're always um, pushing boundaries and sailing close to the wind and end up coming up tops. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I know we're harping a lot on Red Bull, but we've also seen in the news what's happening with Christian Horner. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on that? You know, allegations, uh, if we can even call it, of maybe sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. How do you think it has been dealt with, especially when you look at the FIA saying they will also leave it to Red Bull to conclude those investigations? Okay, so what I heard was that he sent some inappropriate messages to one of his colleagues, which is a lady. Uh, multiple messages apparently, and generally has an aggressive leadership style within the, the factory in Milton Keynes. You're the look on your face. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a very sensitive mat matter. We all know that. Uh, it feels like it's almost being swept under the rug mm -hmm. because it's dragging on. I mean, when it first came out, it seemed to have quite a bit of momentum. Then there was a hearing which was postponed, but now it's gone quiet. And for F1's integrity, I don't think that uh, it's the right call for them to say that they're leaving it to Red Bull because obviously they've got their policies in terms of situations like that. So I think they should be playing a more active role mm -hmm. in trying to f get to the bottom of it and concluding the matter. 
it was rumored that uh, Christian Horner offered the lady 650,000 pounds, which she declined. So you don't know what's what. There's also rumors that there's a tug of war within the management of Red Bull between himself and Dr. Helmut Marko, who's like the chief advisor of Red Bull mm -hmm. and was a close friend of Red Bull founder Dietrich Mateschitz. So they're saying that maybe there's a ploy to try and destroy a um, Christian's name and it, there may be no truth to it because he has refutely denied it. So I'm interested to see where it's going to end up, but I'm a little bit disappointed that it's gone quiet yeah. because it would have been nice to get it out of the way before the season starts. Absolutely. And uh, just as we wrap things up, uh, because I know we are running out of time, mm -hmm. Who are going to be the dark horses uh, for this season that we're going into? Do we maybe see uh, Lewis Hamilton finally getting that eighth that he was denied? I know a lot of people are still saying he still got that eighth. <laughs> now <we're done>. <laughs> <laughs> Will he do it this time? Is Max still going to continue with the dominance? Uh, do we see maybe a Carlos Sainz uh, maybe beating uh, a Charles Leclerc? Who are the dark horses? What do you think will pan out this season? Okay, so Max is obviously the favorite. Hmm. So are Red Bull. I mean, they won both championships last year. Their drivers finished one and two for the first time in their 19 year history in the sport. So this is the best performance that we've seen from Red Bull since uh, they came into the sport in 20, 2005, right? So I expect uh, Max to win the championship. I'm not going hmm. to lie. But, uh, you know, anything can and usually does happen in F1. So, so even, sorry okay. to just no a little further. So even with the Constructors title, you really think it's going to go to Red Bull once again? Yeah, I mean, okay. the fastest car usually gets the Constructors championship. Mm -hmm. But if there's a team close by with a stronger driver lineup, say a Ferrari or a Mercedes, they could sneak it in because I feel like the Red Bull driver lineup there's a huge disparity between max and uh checo perez yeah. but if you look at uh, the ferrari drivers they're pretty evenly matched uh in terms of performance and points collection because they've been teammates for four seasons now the first two seasons carlos Sainz beat uh charles leclerc in the championship and the last two seasons um charles had the measure of of carlos mm -hmm. carlos is obviously driving for his career uh, because now he's back to being in the uncertainty he was in 2015 16. Mm -hmm. So he will obviously be maybe having an eye on Checo Perez's seat possibly for next season, which means he'll really have to perform and he'll want to prove uh, to Ferrari that they made the wrong decision by putting Charles on a long term contract. Then there's Lewis. With Lewis, there's always a chance. I mean, for me, he is the best driver on the grid. Mm -hmm. um, he, his performance even last season, where he was in the fourth or fifth uh, slowest or fastest car, but he ended up being the best of the rest in the championship because only the Red Bull drivers beat him. And if you remember, he was disqualified at Singapore, so that could have even made him runner up in the championship. So for Lewis, there's always a chance. George, uh, he didn't have the best season, as good as the season before, but the Mercedes driver lineup is a strong one as well. And then I think McLaren, they are the dark horses. Ah. Um, they did really well last year in terms of looking where they were in 2022 and the steps they made forward in 2023. And for me, their drivers are also very closely matched, young, hungry, up and coming and still having, having a lot to prove. Then before I finish your time, yeah. Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin uh, is always a threat. And I think he also has an eye on Lewis's seat for next season hmm. at Mercedes. Will we ever see a Grand Prix in South Africa in our lifetime? <laughs> 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 um, I have it in good authority that, yeah, I mean, before we even turn grey. <gasps> <gasps> what? That yeah. would be incredible. Yes, so no, no, it's still, in the, it's still in the cards. Ideally, Liberty Media, which is the broadcast owner of Formula One, they want 25 races and they want them in each and every continent. The only continent that doesn't have a race is Africa. And there's a huge following of F1 in the continent holistically. And obviously, Kailami has its rich history, having hosted 20 plus F1 Grand Prix between 1960 and 1993. So we have the history. 
we have the pedigree. There's just a few things that need to be ironed out in order for us to be compliant and get the facility to be a grade one circuit. I think it's about 126 million rand, which in the greater scheme of things is not much. I know it sounds like a lot, yeah. but um, if you look at the benefits of bringing a Formula One race to South Africa, the tourism exposure, you know, the clouds that it'll bring and the economic benefit throughout all the industries, tourism, sports, etc., then I think it's something that's worth looking at it sure. once we've sorted out the load shedding issue. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. It has been such a pleasure to speak to you. Lufev has truly, you know, just painted this picture nicely, brightly and vividly for us. We are looking, of course, forward to what's going to be happening to Formula One with Formula One this season. It was interesting to see the testing, pre-season testing that happened in Bahrain this past weekend. And the big question is, can Max Verstappen and Red Bull continue? their dominance will Lewis Hamilton finally get that number eight